little bit about me. I've been, um, you know, over 25 years now in the tech industry. I uh, grew up as a developer, um, still code, uh, not as much as I'd like. Um, but, uh, you know, we didn't grow up with very much. And my parents threw me over an old computer and I locked myself in a room for a week. And I had programmed my first game um, after a week. And it just clicked, you know. So I've uh, been working in some tech job or another since then. And that was 12 years old, right? So I've um, uh, been fortunate to be part of a number of startups as well as a number of big brands. And even as a developer, I really felt that um, I really wanted to know what was the impact of my work. You know, uh, I spent a lot of time with business folks and, you know, at the time they were looking at me like, who are you? Just go, go code and pass your unit tests, and, you know, leave me alone. But I really wanted to understand that and um, found that I was very fascinated by the way things are done, um, as well as by leadership development. And so that's, that's my passion. I believe that my mission on this earth is to grow leaders in technology. You know, the name of the game for me um, as a CTO um, has been about transformations, turnarounds, you know, projects where people say, I don't think this is, will ever get off the ground. I, I want that. <laughs> I'm like, I will take that one and I'll, I'll show you otherwise. And so what that's done over my career is it's built a lot of opportunities to learn. You know, when you do a lot of intense transformation, you figure out very quickly um, what works well, what does not work well. And over time at a number of organizations like Experian um, and a number of others, um, I've been fortunate enough to receive a lot of industry awards for some of those transformations, one of them being the Computer World Premier IT100 Award um, as well, which we can talk a little bit about. Um, and that one, in fact, was one where um, we took a, a group of 10 mainframe programmers and retrained them um, in Java, um, in HBase and Hadoop, and we built a product that went to market that was um, experienced top growing product. Um, it's it just incredible story. Um, uh, most incredible thing about it, uh, beyond many of the other layers, is that it was the same people. There was no change in people. And so that's, you know, you'll find one of my principles is that I believe there are hidden gems in every organization, um, people and code, um, and it needs the right leader to be able to look at that and understand the value of what's right under your nose, right? And a lot of companies, I believe, waste a lot of time and money not recognizing that. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to go through a number of those transformations. And over the 10, 15 years of that, um, I built a playbook. Uh, I started to understand uh, what makes a healthy technology strategy. And I've refined it over time purely based on experience. So ruthlessly sharpening um, what that looks like um, over time. Not an academic exercise, not a philosophical exercise really you know grounded in execution um, that's the name of the game and so today we're going to talk about one of those things one of those quadrants um, which is uh, pragmatic agile so um, fast forward to the present um, I now run uh, my own uh, consulting practice um, where I do um, leadership coaching and development for CTOs and their teams um, as well as lead transformations um, against that very playbook that I um, mentioned. So I do a lot of technology audits and then come in and actually lead some of those transformations as well. So it exposes me to a number of great companies, um, great products, and great people ultimately. And I love the friendships that I build throughout it and the lasting impact that can be made. So uh, a big company enterprise level sort of CTO role, um, you know, there are some nuances to that. Um, I think the first thing is, you know, compared to a startup, uh, one of the first things you've got to do as a leader is understand reality. And when you have 18,000 people in an organization that, you know, uh, is a $3 billion company, it's a lot more difficult to get to reality and to get to the truth, um, especially uh, at, at the sea level. So, you know, you, uh, people get used to a certain way of doing things. You know, I love the Matrix movies. So I say, I, I say it was like entering the Matrix. You know, it's like you enter this world where everyone's living as if it's the real world, but it's not, you know, and you sort of have to unplug and figure out what's going on there. So give you, um, I was presented with, uh, you know, I had uh, VPs, directors, managers, leads, developers all under me uh, globally and trying to understand where things are at was really difficult. Um, I was thrown a lot of PowerPoints, 
I was thrown a lot of uh, documents, uh, presentations, all sorts of things like that. And um, basically we cut through all that. And uh, you know, one of the things that I did was said, look, if you wanna be a leader in my organization, you have to be technical. Um, you have to be technical enough and we can talk about what that means. And so um, to use the term uh, that I used back then, I said, I don't want any PowerPoint monkeys. You know, I, I, I don't want management by assumption. You know, a lot of people get so busy in meetings and this happens to all of us, right? We're running around, we're going back to back, back to, to meetings. And then we just have to kind of make a decision because we can't check everything. You trust, but verify, but we can't verify everything. So we're going to trust our head of dev or our head of QA. And, okay, you know, those damn dev developers are a bunch of cowboys. So I'm going to trust that. Now I'm going to make some decisions based on that. And um, we start to lose our way with understanding root cause. And um, then we start making solutions that are not aligned with what those root causes are. So I think that whole process of getting to reality is, is tough. Um, I, I think the other piece that um, uh, really was, was great about the experience was obviously being backed by a lot of support uh, from the CEO and from the rest of the staff uh, budget and, and, you know, any crazy idea I had out there, they were always very supportive as, as long as I backed it up, of course. Um, so that was, that was really, really good and allowed me some freedom to really implement some entrepreneurial things within the company. Dang. Yeah, I used to think as a developer, you know, I just got to keep my head down, build the best code possible, and everything will take care of itself. And that is not true. You know, especially as a CTO, you need to spend at least half your time figuring out how do I communicate outside the value of the work that I'm doing and that my team is doing in a way that the business understands. So you have to kind of map it to their language. Um, you have to make sure the metrics make sense and you have to really spend a lot of deliberate time on that. Well, aspects of that, Etienne, that one is that, you know, I believe that as engineers, we're problem solvers, not problem reporters. You know, don't tell me how hard it is, right? Tell me how hard it is, but how, what are we going to do about it? Uh, at the end of the day, that's what we do. We eat problems for breakfast. We're like, bring, bring the problems. This is what we do. But I think part of it is also our own doing. Like I, I found that even in my own career that I never wanted to communicate up until the solution was perfect, until I knew every variable. And what they really want is they want you to communicate often. Even if you don't know, they want, they want you to be able to say, hey, look, you know, I don't know right now. These are the three things I'm trying out. Just wanted to keep you updated. And, and folks love that. You know, and I learned that when um, my first CTO gig, I had a support guy um, just hounding me to get on a call with an angry customer. And uh, we were working on an issue for them and we had no idea what it was about. And so I said, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna get on a call and just tell them nothing. But he was so persistent that I finally just kind of in a pissed off way said, okay, so you want me to get on the call and basically say nothing. That's what you want me to do? I'll do that, go ahead, fine, you know? And I did, I got on the line and I said, look, we're working on X. Uh, we don't know uh, what it is yet. It's our top priority. In my mind, I said nothing, you know, essentially. Uh, but by the end of the call, the customer was elated. The whole tone of the call changed. And it was such a learning lesson for me that, that you know, analogous to kind of communicating to your CEOs, they just want to know, they want you to communicate off. Each of the quadrants, um, uh, I have initiatives within them and I've defined metrics that I look for or define with each one. So there's all sorts of layers to each quadrant. But first quadrant is um, customer focus or customer voice. So how do we know that we're actually implementing the right things? So this is all about the health of the roadmaps, how roadmaps turn into execution. What does that look like? Because all roadmaps are just a hypothesis anyway. So how do you test the hypothesis, right? And hold that accountable. The second is durable architecture. So how do we know that the decisions we're making every day at the ground level are actually improving the longevity of the code um, or otherwise, right? The third is people strategy. So th this is all about leadership development. Um, it doesn't happen by accident. You know, how do we implement accountability on teams? How do we build proper leaders with the right values, and how do we test for that? And hopefully we'll have time to, to share a couple of those. And then the last one is pragmatic agile. I call it pragmatic agile because everyone says they're agile and it's bullshit, right? Um, so part of this is like really understanding um, what is it that we're trying to achieve? Um, and at the core of it, you know, agile is really about some very basic tenets 
um, that really have nothing to do with whether you do a 15 minute daily stand up or a 20 minute daily stand up. You know, it, that doesn't matter. So um, that, those are the four quadrants. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, my focus is purely execution. And um, my definition of agile comes from experience with executing on projects. And at the end of the day, for me, agile comes down to three core tenets. You know, what are we measuring? What are we learning from the measurement? How are we changing from that learning? Measure, learn, change. That's what it's about. And um, if we're not doing those things, nothing else really matters. And it's supposed to really integrate with all the things that you're supposed to do with Agile, the retros and the planning and everything else. And we can talk about what that means. But at the end of the day, you know, how are we changing from what we're learning? Can we actually show it? Right. So when you do a retro and you uh, the team comes up with a bunch of blockers and impediments, right? Those are those are things that are meant to be attacked right away. Those are blockers. I mean, I've seen teams put that as an action item, and months later, it's still there. You know. So what have you told the team? We don't have a voice. You know. We're just going to move on. So a lot of what I do on on the teams that I work with is you hold the teams and the scrum masters accountable that those impediments have got to be resolved before that next sprint's over, or before you start the next sprint, sorry. So, uh, or you make a conscious decision that you're going to live with it and you're going to move on, right? But we used to measure how many impediment closure rate as an accountability for the team, right? So that's kind of just a tactical example. But at the end of the day, the definition is, what are we measuring? What are we learning from the measurement? How are we changing from the shot? So there's all sorts of different measurements, right? So, and I think all sorts of layers. So. First layer is at the team level, what measurements is the team using to assess its own health, right? So I, I'm a big believer that when you start this whole metrics path, um, it's only for the team, right? The team should just use it to self-adjust. And you sort of make a commitment to the team that at least for the first couple of months, look, we're not gonna use this outside of the team. It's not gonna go on an executive report. It's not gonna go to the board. This is for you guys. This is for you guys to figure out where are we? Hey, our um, average velocity at a good pace has been 20 story points a sprint. It's five this sprint. Okay, guys, what happened? You know, let's ask some questions. Let's figure out what's going on. How can we help? You know, what, you know it's becomes a platform for change, for discussion. Um, a, another thing that I like to measure is, you know, what sort of, how many stories in the roadmap are actually actionable, right? Actually meet the readiness criteria because that affects your throughput. Right, and so let's have a conversation about that. Now at a higher level, at a CTO layer, if you go several layers up, you may require only three metrics. You may be interested in a sort of an aggregate set of things, right? So it's not just a velocity thing. Um, you know, here's another example. When we talk about what makes a good technology leader, everybody has a different definition of that, right? Well, what are the traits? So if you agree on, hey, it's these five traits, and we can talk about some specifics behind that, well, at, at, the end, at every retro, turn to your leader, do a fist of five, and rate them on those traits. It's a very real feedback loop every two weeks. Not something that goes on a performance review or anything like that. But that's an example of taking something that's very tangible and then measuring it. Not necessarily putting a measurement on a dashboard, but doing it within the team rhythm, right? Is every two weeks, there's some sort of feedback loop that's against those traits. Examples of that, and it's been different for every business executive and organization because they care about different things. But I'll give you one example. At one organization, they were um, concerned, whether it's perception or reality, we, we, we can talk about that. Um, they were concerned with product stability, product quality, and release velocity. In other words, you know, there was a problem in that organization with how long it takes us to release, right? What that end-to-end -end cycle looks like, right? So at an aggregate view, we built a CTO dashboard that, looked, that really measured trend over time on incidents, so stability, and downtime, and uptime. And then the second around product quality, the measure was how many issues are we finding post-production versus pre-production, and what those trends look like, and being able to drill down into releases. And then the third was really measuring release duration by release over time. and so. Inherent in that was that there was a project around optimizing the release window, right? So that was an accountability for that project. So uh, in one snapshot view, I could see the trend around stability, 
uh, the trend around quality and the trend around our release velocity. And that was something that only, not only carried forward with the executives, but were things that we shared with key customers as well. Uh, I have many, I, I always say metrics are my love language. So you're, you're speaking my language right now. Um, so another is we, um, uh, with one group, we measured um, the uh, amount of code going to production by release by team. And part of that was addressing that there were certain teams that were experiencing a lot of analysis paralysis where they were spinning their wheels and not really deploying code. Uh, whether there was a fear there or there was some sort of blocker. So we measured that, how much code actually went into production by team and um, did kind of a healthy competition around it as well. And so that brought up, you know, blockers around maybe the DevOps cycle or the release process or testing or whatever it was and allowed us to really dig into the root causes of, well, why, are, why has it been four releases since you've gotten something out the door? What's going on? What's happening here? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, Grady Booch said the most elegant of architectures are the simplest, right? So, you know, delete away. <laughs> I sort of try to stay out of the discussion of like, do we do waterfall? Do we do scrum? Do we do Kanban? Lots of people jump into that. Uh, and that's certainly a conversation. Um, I think, um, uh, at the end of the day, it's really more about the principles and how we're implementing them, uh, to be honest. And that kind of conversation, of, hey, we'll leave it for uh, the bar or coffee date after. You know, we can talk philosophy all, all we want. But I think Kanban, I mean, typically, uh, I think we know Kanban has typically been used for uh, support or where there is a faster response that's needed. Um, I don't know that I have a recommendation one way or the other because it really depends on the situation. Um, what I really hone in on are for every ceremony, agile ceremony that we're going through, what are we measuring? What are we hoping to get out of it, right? So when we have a grooming session or we have an agile planning session, what is the measurement that says that session actually what I call well. introspective analytics, right? So how do we now turn our analytics chops and our metrics chops inward to at every ceremony really measure what what's going well here and can we adjust uh, right that customer focus durable architecture people leadership development and and the pragmatic agile pieces there are uh, groups of measurements that i look for in each one of those right so so for example with a roadmap how do you know that the roadmap's working so here's something where and it's all it's never as sort of simple as here's the metric go measure it you, you sort of have to look at the spirit behind it and i'll give you a quick example so around uh, roadmaps as an example. So when, when I do agile planning sessions, right, where we do roadmap planning, um, oftentimes we get together, you know, product owner goes through the stories, um, people break into groups, or if it's just one group, and then you start to break down the work, and you know, boom, 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 you sort of kind of move forward, right? Um, what I like to do, especially in a roadmap planning session, whether it's for the quarter or for the next month, bring in a business stakeholder, bring in an executive, bring the person that's most passionate about the ROI of that particular project and have them, and then bring everybody in the room that is involved with execution, even if they're not on the same team, even if they're not used to working together, even if they hate each other, right? Bring them all together in the same room and have that business leader speak to his or her vision of what this project is about. This is what I'm trying to achieve. This is what I'm being put pressure on. This is, you know, when this is done, here's what we're gonna be able to do. And then you kind of unleash the whole room on that person to ask questions, to fully understand. So it's almost like this business person is running a startup and you've got a bunch of venture capitalists, except they're all the execution people. They're all our team members. And they get to ask a bunch of questions and challenge. And have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And when we're all clear, then the product manager, product owner can get up and say, all right, well, based on that, this is what our roadmap priorities are for that period of time. Now, when you start to break into groups and start kind of breaking down the work, it shifts from a developer looking at a story and saying, what are the tasks I have to do to finish the story to, I understand the spirit behind what we're doing. Mm. I know that the story is written in this way, but if I did these other things, I could actually accomplish the spirit of it. Now you've got a collective ownership on things. So, you know, it's sort of, you've got developers thinking in innovative ways, you've created a space for that. So in that example, it's not a one metric thing. It's sort of the whole process behind it, 
and how we measure things, it pops up in sort of other measurements downstream, minimum okay. once a quarter, yes. You check in because you've been executing for a quarter, now you go, okay, well, what have we learned? And how do we are going to adjust our yeah. business vision and our roadmap against that, right? Before we decide what we're gonna do next. So, if yeah. you have a small team that works pretty well together, you know, like I, I was just working with a team that they've been together for years. Uh, it's a small team, seven people. Uh, they don't have a scrum master. You know, they sort of rotate the duty between one or two folks and they're fine, right? They're absolutely fine. You start getting into multiple product lines, uh, multiple teams where things need to be consistent in terms of how we execute, how we measure. Um, you start to face some scaling challenges and there needs to be somebody who can run that health around culture and execution and own that so that everybody else can actually develop. So I think the scaling wall, one of the, one of the points of it is when whoever's acting as a scrum master starts to feel blockers in their capacity uh, to develop or to test or to execute in some way because they have to hold on to these duties, right? So when it starts to becoming in conflict, you know you're starting to scale, you're starting to grow. I built a global agile office there, that's what we called it, um, and it served a global team. We didn't have more than seven people there, seven scrum masters, right? Mm. So I don't believe that you need a massive organization, sort of like what PMO does, where you know you build this massive org of project managers and there's sort of this one-to-one -one relationship between project managers. And you know, I think if you do it right and you invest in in the consistency behind it, you can accomplish a lot of scale um, uh, when you do that. Yeah, because uh, ultimately we all get asked, so when is it going to be done, right? So a big part of that is one is you have to have a system that sort of protects you. One of the things that um, I've seen that very few teams do is measure their own capacity or even have an understanding of what their capacity is. So we estimate a project, but I've got four other projects on my plate and we're estimating the project as if we're 100% allocated to that project and it's not real. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it is, do we have an understanding of our capacity? What can we actually normally handle, right? And, and knowing some of the nuances of the team, like, hey, we have this one developer who um, consistently is 50% over their estimate because, you know, they, they think that, you know, they can handle more than they can. Or, you know, just having that intelligence of the team and incorporating that into the capacity, into the estimate. And having the, as you said, meta intelligence or the introspective analytics around knowing like, hey, for that particular product with this particular team, we're usually 200% over our estimate. Well, why, are, why is that? you know, and being able to be transparent about that up to the organization. So I think that's a big part of it is, you know, oftentimes I see people in a room just getting asked in a meeting, so how long can this be, uh, you know, take you? Oh yeah, no problem, I'll get it done in two days and then, you're, and then you're screwed, right? So as long as you have a system in place where you say, look, in our monthly roadmap meeting, this is how we're gonna estimate, here's the intelligence we're gonna bring into it and bring to the surface, and then this is how we're going to report against that estimation moving forward, um, I think things are easier. Um, I still think there's a long road to go with business executives understanding that estimates are purely that, they're estimates, um, and they can change and they can adjust. It comes down to trust. And a lot of times I'm presented with the problem statement from a business owner, my dev team is too slow. And uh, nine times out of 10, that's actually not the issue at all. You know, you dig into it and you find it's something else completely. Like, hey, they're all working hard, but here's what's actually happening, you know? So one example of that was uh, uh, at a startup that I was with, um, they uh, were in growing pains, scaling, um, heading towards Series E. And um, they had a problem where uh, you had a, a set of dev teams. Uh, there were actually five agile teams. Um, there was a product roadmap. And then there were customers that were just pissed about basic functionality um, not uh, working in the application. But none of those broken windows were part of the roadmap. So the roadmap was just moving forward and, and supporting sales because, hey, you got to sell, right? So there was this disconnect and there was this growing resentment um, within account management and support that they weren't listened to. And meanwhile, the developers had no idea what was going on with on the front lines. Um, and, and there was this disconnect there. And the problem statement that was given was, developers are not taking care of customers, right? And the account managers were on the phone every week with key customers just getting yelled at about the same issues every week, all the time, with no resolution in place. They're just trying to figure out what to say 
to get to the next week and to survive. And um, they came to, to uh, believe that product and development do not listen to them. So why try? So there was this sort of culture that was built on the account management side. And the product folks were like, yeah, yeah, you know, that's not really important. I need to go, um, you know, support sales. So one of the things we did, and again, not something that scales, but we did it as a way to set the tone and as a symbol of here's what can be accomplished when things are aligned, we brought those five teams together. And we said for a period of time, and it was actually a three-week period of time, and we said, you are all one team, and we're going to Kanban it, okay? And your product owners in these three weeks are the account managers, not the product managers, not the product owners. Your product owners will be the account managers. Now, we got them together. And there is a certain sense of, you know, when people complain and complain and complain about something, like, hey, developers are not developing, and then you put them in a position to actually solve the problem, sometimes they just freeze. You know, they're like, we were happy complaining. You know, I, I, I don't, we didn't want to solve the problem, actually. You know, I was happy to just complain about you guys. So there was a little bit of that, but we got them in and we said, we developed the backlog, give us your top priority customer fires. Every day we met at eight in the morning, the entire team, the entire account management team, and we prioritized and we talked about who's going to do what. And you found that developers, when they were freed of their team structure a bit, they started working together. Developers that don't normally work together, work together, they looked at things and went, oh, I didn't know that was an issue. I could fix that today which kind of pissed them off even more, the account managers, right? Like, hey, wait a minute. But in that three-week period, they fixed more customer issues than they've ever fixed in the like, last six months. And one of the account managers who was the loudest voice uh, or critic of development got up in the retro after three weeks and said, listen, guys, I, um, was, I just want you to know that I kept going to this weekly call with this customer and they kept yelling at me about the same issues. It's been like that for months. I went on the call this week and they had nothing to say. They said all the issues were fixed. We had nothing to talk about. So I just want you to know that I was really resentful of you, but I want you to know from now on, you have a champion in me, you have an evangelist in me. And sure enough, you know, for the next six to eight months, that individual really became a champion, ultimately became a product manager, right? So, and moved uh, from the account management team. So that's just one example of like getting to the root cause behind estimation, the lack of trust, the lack of voice, the, hey, we got to deliver customer value every day. How do we do that? How do we simplify and get through all the structures and the bureaucracy and the process to ultimately serve our customers? Um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think a couple of things to look at is, look, you know, if you already have metrics in place, are they, are, are, are your teams are on, on a, sorry, on automatic mode, you know, like in stand up, you know, I worked on one, two, three, today I'm going to work on three, four, five, no impediments. And everyone says the same thing around the room. Well, that's not working for you, all right? So are there things in place that you're doing where people are just on automatic mode? They're kind of going through the motions. And if that's the case, it's time to just call it out. You know, in, in that case, I would call out and say, I don't think the stand-up is working for us, right? So let's talk about what the real impediments are and let's spend some time on that and really hone in on that. So I, I would encourage to look past the metrics if you already have them. And look at the root causes of what you're trying to achieve. You're really trying to get your team to work together better. You're trying to team to deliver faster without sacrificing quality. You're trying to get at the root cause of like have, helping them understand what customer value they're delivering. Now, if you don't have metrics or you're struggling with how to do that, um, try one or two, right? But bring the team into that. Don't impose it on the team. Bring the team into that and say, what, what are sort of some of the things that we uh, can assess our own health with? You know, how would we know that we are actually doing a good job in this next sprint? What does that look like to us? And then practice. You know, it's kind of like a muscle. You exercise it. Practice a couple sprints uh, and bring it up in a retro and say, all right, um, what did that measurement look like? What did our velocity look like? Is that helpful to us? No, it's not helpful. Okay, scratch it off. Uh, what else can we be looking at? Um, and some of that is going to be a bit intuitive as a leader where you're listening to your team Listen to what they're complaining about. Listen to what they're talking about. You know, that is always an opportunity for teasing out um, a measurement of some sort, right? Can we capture that somehow? Because uh, as an analogy, it's one thing to tell a business leader, we're way over capacity. Like we can't handle any more work. That's another thing to actually show them, right? So 
you want to be able to protect the team. You want to listen to what some of the things that need to be captured so that you can protect them better and also hold them accountable um, as well. Uh, the team isn't delivering all the, you know, so if, is, it, is it the team? Is it the VP? Is it, yep. like, how have you assessed that? I've got a great one for this. I, lo this is, I love this topic, okay? So, so uh, you know, there was an example where um, I, I was a CTO at an organization where they were, it was a hugely matrix organization, lots of teams, okay? Um, and it just so happened on one product line, you had eight different teams working on the same product, okay? Each one had a piece. And so what was happening because of how siloed they were, they were all agile, they all running ceremonies, they're all measuring, all that stuff, okay? Um, you had one team that was always green in their sprint and they were working on just one piece So they happen to work be working on the login and SSO flow So whatever features and enhancements within login and SSO they would do that in the sprint They would be done and they're green. Meanwhile, the actual a goal of the sprint is not green It's not functional, right? All the other teams are behind but there they would sit back and go. We're done. We're good. We're ready to go so what I did is I started capturing, instead of measuring the stories in every sprint with every team, I started capturing the workflow. So what is the end-to-end -end workflow that we're trying to make functional? And that workflow could cross all eight teams, all their deliverables, right? So I made it more about the functional workflow. And then I had QA build a set of automated tests against that workflow. And literally, I did the Homer Simpson one button thing and every day, if someone came to me and said, I'm green, I said, oh, really? Let me run that test. I'd run the test, fail, right? And it would fail every day until the whole, function, the whole flow was functional. And what that did for a team like the login SSO team was it sent the message, you are not done. You are not done until it's defined as done by the customer. You are not done until it's all functional. So what it started to do is it brought some teams to the surface that uh, were selfish and only uh, in their own little bubble and really didn't care about the customer and then you had some other teams that were green and they said You know that uh, that team down the workflow They, they actually need my help because now I'm being held accountable to something beyond my team I, I'm part of something actually much bigger my role in technology is to serve the customer And so we did that uh, literally the entire sprint I am pushing the button to run that test until it's functional so as a CTO it's about really simplifying and sharpening focus to bring that accountability. Like, hey, I don't care what the, how the teams are structured. I don't care how you're doing sprints, but this is how I'm gonna measure you. Uh, maybe just a, a parting thought, and there's so much more to unpack here. I mean, maybe there's a part two of this, but uh, personally, as CTOs, I wanna speak to you as individuals, all of us together. This has an impact on our careers. So we get lost in the shuffle, we get lost in all the pressure that we're on. If we don't take the time to to actually do the thing, some of the things that I've talked about and getting into the weeds and holding people accountable for the right things. You wake up one day and you, you go home and you're like, what did I do today? I attended a bunch of meetings. Like at the end of the day, we're all in this game to make an impact in a very tangible way. And you don't wanna acquiesce that power to anybody else. So a part of this is also, there's an individual part of all of this as a leader of taking control um, of your own career story and what sort of impact you're making as a leader on these teams as well through that pragmatic agile framework and process, right? What did you look for in VPs of engineering or? Ooh. Oh, that's such a good one. So I actually have, um, I actually look for very specific things and I look for the same things every time. Um, so the, the first thing is I look for a sense of ownership. Like I want someone who owns it, you know, uh, beyond just their own deliverables. Like, it's like kind of like being, I love basketball. So, you know, I, I do the, you know, like, it's like you're on the court, you're all playing on the same team. You don't have the luxury to be a fan in the stands criticizing. Like, I can't believe that shot that Etienne just took. What is he thinking? You know, but sometimes we do that. Sometimes developers do that. They sort of step outside of their team and point the finger. So you want someone that owns it, right? That at the end of the day, um, they're going to raise their hand and say, it was my fault. And here's how I'm going to change it, right? The second is something you mentioned earlier, Tian, which is technical competence. But I'm going to put a little flavor on that, which is, you know, uh, engineering mindset. And the way I measure that is, are they speaking from firsthand experience, experiential knowledge? So I always tell my teams, I don't care about your opinions. I know it sounds rush, uh, harsh, 
right? But we're engineers. We're not in this business for opinions. We're, we're not, we don't work for People Magazine. Like you, you either, you POC it and you prove it. So if you want to earn a seat at the table, go prove it, go do the work, present the findings, and you will definitely have a voice. But don't come in here saying you read an article and you want to try something, right? We're, we're too busy for that. We're running a business. We need to deliver customer value every day. So speak to me about your firsthand experience. Go learn the product. Go talk to customers. Go spend a week with support. Whatever it is you need to do to be in the weeds and to learn, right? So I think that's very important. Um, the other I look for is, you know, someone who eats problems for breakfast. Like, they just hungry, you know? They just, they, they, they're, they're not looking at it as a complaint thing. They're looking at it as, yes, bring those problems on because ultimately that's why we have jobs anyway. If there were no problems, don't need you, right? So, you know, you want someone who's really attacking it, going after it, knows how to build trust, right? Um, knows how to, when you're talking about leadership, I look for, give me an example of how you held the team accountable. What does accountability look like to you? What does that mean? Like, all right, they didn't hit their deliverable. Now what? What do you do? You know, and kind of walking them through some behavioral uh, questions around that. So it's more than that. Hey, uh, give me some stories, multiple of how uh, people's careers have grown under you. What did that look like? Where did they start? And how did you take them through that path? What do we, we, want, we want somebody who grows leaders, right? We want someone who's going to not only scale architecture, but scale the people, scale the organization. Mm -hmm.